without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the filmmakers, uh, Almadena Caracedo and Robert Behar, to introduce their film to you. Thank you, everyone. We're so happy to be here and so happy to see all of you from all of these schools. I think the best way to start is, you know, at what point did you both get involved in uh, this issue and, and get involved in the, in the whole project? Where did it all begin? I read a story about sweatshops in L.A. and I was very impacted by the fact that it was um, immigrant workers doing it and especially immigrant women. In this case, I just wanted to do a little video that they could use to engage other workers in, in their organizing and to show to students as well. Um, but of course, what happened is that I, you know, I started meeting with the workers, I started getting to know them, I fell in love with the women, uh, I saw their sense of humor and also their you know, humanity, and then that grew bigger. You know, there are lots of documentaries where you see people talking who are kind of like experts and this felt like a film where the women themselves could tell their own story. And that was very, very beautiful to me. And so I think once I started to see some of the footage that had already started to be edited, that's when I got on board. And that was about a year into the project. It took five years to make this film. This was a very, very long and hard process. In our case, the fact that it was just me on the camera is what allows that kind of intimacy with the women, that very intimate feeling with them. Because when they're talking to the camera, when they're talking to you, in reality, they're talking to me. And so that actually brought a lot of beautiful things um, out of, you know, in the film. That kind of relationship of trust that was created between me and the woman and the women. I thought the scene where uh she goes and sees the, the immigrant workers' sweatshops from the 19th century uh, and Ellis Island. Without those scenes, it, it, it has just kind of an isolated significance, you know, that, oh, this is happening to those people in L.A., but it, it goes back and it's part of history now. The organizer wanted to take Lupe there so she could see, so Lupe could see the larger context of her struggle, right? And so it was my first time in New York as well. It was Lupe's first time. So that moment of epiphany when she realizes that it's not a new story, it's not like she's doing something new, that she's part of a larger history of immigration to this country, of a larger history of a struggle to this country. What would have happened if they would have lost the lawsuit? Would you have finished still to the end? Would you still have published this video? What would you have done? If they had lost, which could be a possibility, tons of struggles to start and they don't win, um, I think we would have still concentrated in the heart of a film. We use the campaign as a backbone, right? Like a storyline, like beginning, middle, end. It begins, then it has all these obstacles, and then uh, the film ends. But the real heart of a film is the transformation of the women. How we, as humans, change when we embark on this kind of journey. How it impacts our self-esteem, our identity. You know how Lupe changes from being sort of like a, a rebellious kid to actually making change and transforming her anger into creating positive change in, in her community. I just wanted, wanted to, to say, say that, uh, that uh, I, I, the, film the film was absolutely, absolutely beautiful. beautiful. We really, we really appreciate, appreciate you being here, here to, uh, to, uh, to talk to, talk to, us, to us about, about it. it. Um, um, and my and question, question was, was uh, whether, whether you know, you know of any instances where this, where this film, film has inspired, inspired others, others uh, with, with, with similar, similar you know, desires, you know, desires to, fight. to fight? Just one example. We got to go do a screening at Yale University in New Haven. And after doing that event, um, we did a panel discussion, and we were there to speak about the filmmaking, but there were also organizers there who were involved in local struggles. One of those was a struggle against a local restaurant. One of those was a struggle for home care workers. Um, and after that, those groups went on and took copies of the film, and they did their own screenings in the community. And some of the workers in that home care struggle um, they filed a lawsuit against their employer. And when they filed that lawsuit, they actually had a poster of Made in LA up at their press conference. And they said you know, later that this was one of the things that gave them courage and inspired them to take this on. So that's just one example of how the film has been an organizing tool and has been useful 
in terms of these kinds of struggles. Do you think that by protesting and boycotting, it would lead to outsourcing of those jobs and therefore less jobs for immigrants? I would never argue that workers should accept less than minimum wage because otherwise the jobs might go away. You know, that's a value that we actually have established here you know, as a very deep-seated thing about how workers should be treated. But, but I think in terms of this question about jobs going away, during the course of the making of this film and during the last several decades, many, many manufacturing jobs have been leaving the United States. And it's not because workers have been protesting. It's really these much bigger global economic issues where there's just much, much less expensive labor available overseas, and it changes. You know, one year, a certain country will be the lowest price, and then that'll change. So what we're seeing for a lot of workers, like the workers in the film, is that some of these jobs are going away. But the service jobs, you know, like working in hotels and restaurants, the agricultural work, the service sector, if anything, is continuing to grow. So a fight to get better working conditions in garment factories in LA can help car wash workers in LA feel that they're going to be able to fight to get better working conditions. So these struggles kind of influence each other. Everything that we wear or that we eat or that we use is made by a person like us or like our parents, you know? So it's important to realize that connection um, and to really assert our, as po our power as consumers and as citizens too in the choices that we make. Now, what a tremendous uh, show for all of us. Thank you for taking us beyond ourselves too to another glimpse of humanity just in various parts of the world. My question really has not to do with the central characters, but what is it about the characters, the lawyers, the, uh, the two ladies who were the advocates at the center, what is it that's within them that makes them who they are and maybe would challenge all of us to be maybe somewhat like them? Julie Sue, like John, used to translate for their parents who were immigrant workers and didn't know the language. When we talked to Julie Sue about why she became a lawyer, what she said was that, I believe that in this country, the language of power is the law. So if I understand the law, I can translate the language of power you know, for workers or for people who are engaged in a struggle who don't know that language of power. I can help them speak in the language of power. And I found that to be such an interesting you know, encapsulation of that idea of what purpose a lawyer can serve and how they fit into a struggle. It's not her struggle, but she can take this powerful, important role in that struggle. What you had said earlier about trust and, and, and those things that are behind what you're doing uh, says a lot about the types of filmmakers that you are. We're, we, you guys are very fortunate to have met these people here today, and I want you to thank them with your applause for, for coming. From all the way from L.A. to, to be with you today. And I guess it's...